after this I was still very much into sports bikes I leaned more towards the touring type rather than the, the full super sports after riding a GSX-R I really wanted a larger tourer the other thing I was really interested in was a Ducati Monster 900 I looked at a few Ducatis but found them physically too small for me so my mind was made up it had to be more of a sports tourer I then found a Suzuki RF900 the bike was in pretty good condition it just needed the front brakes being bled this would become my 12th bike I picked this up for under a thousand pounds and still riding to work every day this became a solid workhorse the bike was super reliable and had lots of power but again older bikes and issues the story just keeps coming back and back and back we have all heard the same line when people say honest mate it was working fine earlier when you're looking to buy a bike well the RF900 was one of those sorts of bikes I'd had the bike a while and it was running really well to a point that I needed a new pair of tyres so I got them fitted and about three days later I was going to see my then girlfriend so I filled the bike full of petrol I got to her house and parked the bike up the next day I went to go home and it wouldn't start I tried everything but couldn't get it to start I eventually found a local mobile mechanic that would come out and he said if he couldn't start it he would tow it home for me yeah you guessed it two hours later it was on the back of his trailer being towed home the next day the mechanic came back and spent three hours looking at everything but nothing would get this bike started I eventually sold the bike on eBay as a complete bike with a non-running engine for less than the price of a tank of petrol and the new tyres it was snapped up within 10 minutes and the buyer turned up with a trailer and told me he only needed the frame and the bodywork because he was going to put a new engine in it and use it for drag racing I hope what was left of it served him well with the RF900 gone I really needed a bike especially for work and the next bike was to be the last bike I would own before my life totally changed. I was seriously struggling to find a new bike in my price range. It was summer and there was nothing remotely decent for sale. And then by pure chance, I saw a Honda CBR1000F for sale, about 50 miles away. I rang the guy and it sounded almost too good to be true. I'd always liked the CBR range, but preferred the Tourers to the sports models. I got a friend to drive me to see the bike in just outside Dagenham. When I got there, it was exactly as described. Perfect condition, CBR 1000S Sports Sura in Ferrari red. And apart from the front brake caliper deciding to piss brake fluid everywhere, I couldn't find a single thing wrong with this bike. Hell, it was even kept in a central heated shed. Very quickly, 1,000 pounds changed hands and I was riding a 1,000cc motorbike over the Dartford Bridge with no front brake and a decent fear of heights. The front brake issue is resolved with a simple copper washer and the CBR, like all CBRs, is a very reliable solid bike. Not only was this again used every day, but was smart enough to turn heads at bike meets. And yes, the colour on the logbook was Ferrari red. This bike also got me the most speeding tickets. So far this journey has taken us from my first look at a motorbike in the, in the early to mid 70s, to owning my first bike in the mid 80s, and now the CBR 1000 in early to mid 2011. And this is where things really changed. Now in my 40s, thinking my life was pretty much settled, we moved to another chapter of my life. I met someone who went the world to me. She was in one country and I was in another. We toyed with the idea of her moving to the UK, but it was clear that wasn't going to work. So the natural thing for me was to move to Spain. It was now 2012. I had the CBR, but the import fees and the taxes and processes, it just wasn't worth the effort or the value of the bike to import it to Spain. So I made a choice to sell it. I put it out for sale in Bike Trader and some guy from Essex came and took it off my hands instantly. That was it. I was again without a bike and in a few weeks we'd be moving to Spain. And yes, a tear or two did roll down my face as that bike was taken away. But obviously the story doesn't end there. So once set up in Spain, obviously I wanted another motorcycle. But things aren't that simple when you live in a country that isn't your home country. Although I lived in Spain, I was working in Gibraltar. And I worked with a guy who recently bought a 350cc scooter. He was looking to offload a motorbike, a Dalim 125 Custom. Dalim is a South Korean company selling cheap motorbikes. Obviously riding a GSX-R, a CBR, a GPZ, a GS. The last thing I wanted was a cheap Korean knockoff 125. But I didn't really have an option. This part of the world is a mecca for mopeds and I never want another moped. As the Dalim was Gibraltar registered and I live in Spain, I couldn't own it on paper unless I imported it and it really wasn't worth it. So we agreed I would buy the bike, it would stay in the other guy's name, but for all intents and purposes it would be mine. 
So I became the not so proud owner of a very rusty, dead battery, beaten up Korean 125 motorbike for the cost of 200 pounds. I brought the bike home and straight away bought a new battery and got to work with a clean up. After a weekend, the bike was running well and actually looked a lot better. This basically became the, the main transport for the two of us to get to work, but we aren't little people and this bike was just too small. After a while, I started to get some of my Spanish paperwork in place, so I decided to look for another bike, this time for a major known brand and bigger than a 125. In Spain, the mentality is very simple. If you're selling a second-hand vehicle when you initially paid, let's say, 5,000 for it, then you want 5,000 for it because that's what it's worth. Depreciation means nothing here. Added together that pretty much everyone rides scooters means that if you can find a real bike, it will be overpriced. During my time here, I had met a couple of people that had bikes, so I started asking around, but no one knew of any decent bikes at reasonable prices. Then I saw a 1990 Yamaha Virago 535 for sale in a car showroom. I asked about the bike, and the guy wanted 2,000 euros. Two grand was so overpriced. I showed him a listing from a UK bike trader with the same bike in the same year for 900 pounds. His reply, this isn't the UK. Obviously, I walked away. About six months later, that Virago was still in the window of the car showroom. So I went back in and asked again. This time the guy was prepared to drop to 1,800 euros. Again, I thought this is overpriced. But the exchange rate at the time was really in my favor because it was before Brexit, which meant I would be paying about 200 pounds over the normal asking price in the UK. As there was no other option, we bought the bike and paid cash. This was my 15th motorcycle. The instant the man had the cash in his hands, there was a pequeño problemo, a small problem. We needed to be registered with the local tax office, so we had to jump through hoops to get all this sorted so we could take possession of the bike just before Spain shuts down for an entire week for Semana Santa, more commonly known as Easter week. After finally getting everything sorted, we got the bike at the last minute and decided we would take the bike to go up to a hotel in the mountains. With the hotel pre-booked, on the day we set off on our first epic road trip all through the mountains, this ancient castle that's converted into a hotel. For those of you who know, know the area, it's a place called Castellar de la Frontera. We left home about midday and we arrived at the hotel 35 minutes later. Talk about an overhyped road trip. But to be fair, the road to that castle is pretty amazing. And I still go there about one or two times a year. But now knowing I can go there and back in less than two hours. And we definitely don't need a hotel. At this point, we still had the Dalim and now the Yamaha. The second Yamaha Virago I'd ever owned. The Dalim basically became a parking space saver to stop people parking in front of my gate. Until eventually the Spanish police towed it away as it hadn't moved in about eight months and had a Gibraltarian number plate. Even though I turned it around every weekend, I, I never bothered to reclaim it. It wasn't worth the effort. So we then just had the Virago. And to be fair, it was a good, reliable bike. No real issues occurred, and it served us well. I bought it at 35,000 kilometers. Now it has 96,000 kilometers. My girlfriend decided to buy a scooter. She bought a Sim 50cc scooter. Again, a Korean vehicle, but it looks a lot like a Vespa. She rode it for about 1,000 kilometers, and we got the restrictions removed from the exhaust and the calves. And then she never used it again. It's now about 10 years old and sat in the garage. It has a genuine 1,000 kilometers on it. Maybe one day I'll clean it up and get it running again. Perhaps she'll ride it, who knows? I still have the Virago, and we'll come back to that again shortly. But after about two years of owning it, we decided the Virago was too small for the pair of us. So we started looking for another motorcycle. I looked at many Japanese custom bikes and finally found a Suzuki Intruder VL800 locally for an unextortionate price. I managed to meet the guy and it was clear the bike was well looked after and it was clear he didn't really want to sell it but he was having issues with his wrists. I offered him the full asking price and the deal was struck. We agreed to go back to my house to, to exchange money and paperwork. I rode home, he followed me on his bike and his wife followed him in the car with all the original bike parts. One of the things to mention here in Spain when it's time for the periodical safety inspection, the ITV, or the MOT, all vehicles must be presented for testing in their original condition, or they will fail the test. So if you change the handlebars, that's a fail. Remove the rear seat to make it look like a bobber, that's a fail. Put a better headlight on, that's a fail. Put on non-CE approved mirrors, that's a fail. 
it's really that simple. Even if you do something to improve the bike, it's a fail. It has to be presented in its original condition. So with the intruder came original pipes, original handlebars, original front and rear mud guards. When we got back to the house to finalise the deal, the guy was hesitant, but this was very early in January. And on the 6th of January, it's Three Kings Day. It's like Christmas, but more important in Spain. I could see the guy was hesitant to sell, but his wife wanted the bike sold. So when I counted out 4,000 euros in front of her, two days before Three Kings, she scooped up the cash and the deal was done. When I got the 800 Intruder, it had 32,000 kilometers on it. It now has 97,000 kilometers. It's been an amazing bike, and aside from the battery dying, the only issue I had with it was during 2020, when it wasn't being used very often. It developed a spluttering issue. I changed the plugs, the leads, the fuel injectors, but I couldn't find out the issue. What I didn't know at the time was there was a fuel filter in the tank, and that was the problem after all. So during 2020, what I like to refer to as the bullshit era and all the lockdown time, I needed a hobby. The Virago had sat in the corner of my garage for about three years, so I decided it was time to do something about it. So I spent six months turning it into a bobber. The bike can't really go on the road again due to having very short straight through pipes and many other mods, but only needs oil and fuel to run. I still have this Virago and it's sat in my garage. I don't think I'll ever get rid of it. There is a video of this bobber build on my channel. It would be amazing to take this bike out, but there is absolutely no way this will ever pass the ITV inspection. So we find ourselves post 2020, and we're getting to the point of getting the M109R. But before I do, I want to go back about eight to 10 years. And I went to a small local bike rally. It was run by a bike club called Los Lobos, which translates to the wolves. And there I saw a couple of bikes. These were Suzuki M1800s or M109Rs. They looked amazing, and I had never seen this model before. I was hooked. This was to become my dream bike, along with the Ducati 916, the Honda NR750, or the Honda CBX1000, and either of the Easy Rider bikes. In 2022, the, the, the Intruder 800 was still playing up the fuel issue, and I was in the market for a new bike. Here in Spain, we have a website called Milanuncia. I guess it's like eBay or Craigslist. For a foreigner, it's the easiest way to buy a bike. I started searching for bikes and found a few possibilities, but I knew I was looking for the M109R. I just had to find it. And to be fair, if I did a search of all of Spain and its islands, I would be lucky to find three of them. They are really scarce in Europe, due to the EU not wanting bikes like this, and Suzuki don't even sell them in Europe. Eventually I found one about 50 miles away in a place called Mikas, just past Marbella. An American import, it looks stunning, but it was white, and I don't know why, but I've never owned a white bike, and I really was hesitant about buying it. I messaged the guy, and he had said he had very little interest. Maybe, again, it was because of the colour. I don't know. Anyway, I went to see the bike, and I will be honest, it looked amazing. It rode amazing. It sounded amazing. It turns heads everywhere you go. And even the friend that drove me there said if I didn't buy it, he would. So I bought it, and I rode it home. It is incredible. It's such a large motorcycle that really has its own presence on the road. When parked, it's a crowd puller. I remember seeing a video on YouTube from the Bikes and Beards guy who said, this bike will get you speeding tickets just by being parked in the road. He isn't wrong. This thing draws attention from everywhere. Shortly after getting the M109, I was going to work and the engine cut out. As soon as I restarted it and put it in gear, it cut out again. I got it towed to my local mechanic who diagnosed the worst. The clutch had gone and needed replacing. 700 euros later and I'm back on the road. Maybe that's why the previous owner had little interest. Maybe others knew something I didn't. Maybe I was seeing the bike through those road scenes glasses. I still think the M109 is my dream bike. But after two years of owning this bike, this cruiser, can surprise you. It has immense power and the huge 240 back tyre just sends you flying forward. It's great to be enjoying a ride and still have a little bit of fear in the back of your mind just niggling away at your overconfidence even after all these years of riding. I realise that there aren't many people on YouTube with channels dedicated to the M109 and the ones that are there are so good. I always watch their videos and get inspiration to improve my channel further and we often converse over their videos. So I decided to dedicate my tiny channel that had eight videos in really crap quality to my bike. 
As for the VL800, I still have that as well. But I took the time to strip it down and clean and polish it. So it's almost back to original. There's also a video of this on my channel. And that leads us today, 2024. Three motorbikes in my garage, 17 motorbikes owned, one growing YouTube channel, and a lifetime, well, about 47 years of the love of motorcycles. But I've always fancied building an old school 1970s type shop. So maybe this story isn't over yet. Maybe this is still just the beginning. Perhaps I just need to get my hands on an XF650 or a CB750. I hope there are people out there that can relate to parts of my story and it would be amazing to see or hear other people's stories. As always, I thank you for the views, the likes, the comments, the subscriptions and of course the support. I guess there's only one thing left to say. I hope you enjoy this trip back in my history and let's keep riding.